Morning, everybody. I'm Cormac Collier, Executive Director at Nantucket Land Council. Thanks, everybody, for coming, uh, particularly on this windy day. But it looks like we're going to get a little sun this afternoon, which is great. Um, as you know, uh, what we're here to talk about is uh, best management practices um, to reduce uh, nutrient leaching um, into our groundwaters and our estuaries and harbors and ponds. Um, we've been working on this, um, oh gosh, for about the past 10, 15, 20 years. But a lot of exciting um, and monumental things have happened just in the past two to three years, which um, we, as a nonprofit, want to uh, bring forth to the community and let the community know a little bit more about. Before I get going, I just want a, um, a show of hands. I, I recognize almost everybody, but um, how many people have uh, landscapers that maintain their lawns and gardens? OK, and how many people do their own? Okay, so this fairly well-educated crowd um, in terms of uh, going forward, but that just uh, sort of helps uh, set it up. So um, objectives today for um, what we're going to talk about. What I want to do is just lay a foundation um, for the nutrient overloading issues that are on Nantucket. Um, I think everybody is somewhat familiar with them, but it's important to get that foundation to know what the problem is and um, identify solutions for going forward. Again, the environmental prob uh, problems. Um, the process for creating the new Board of Health regulations, which um, is one of the monumental things that I discussed. Uh, the Board of Health adopted um, regulations to control the type and quantity of fertilizer use and a number of other things last summer. And they went into effect this past January 1st. Um, and then also some of the core stuff that we're going to talk about is the Best Management Practices document, which is um, a document that was created um, to help uh, educate the, uh, the community. And then again, the overview of the best management practice. So just a little bit about the Land Council. I'm sure so, most of you know um, what we are, but we were established in 74. We're a watchdog agency at our core. We attend all um, development uh, uh, applications uh, in the town, planning board, CONCOM, other, other, things, other agencies like that, and advocate for the protection of natural resources. Uh, we also attend town meeting um, and advocate there. Uh, we do a lot of scientific research, science research in the ponds, um, in, with rare endangered species, and with um, invasive species and things of that nature. And then also we hold conservation restrictions. This is a tool, a conservation open space tool, separate from owning a fee title, uh, whereby we purchase or accept the donation of a restriction, essentially an easement on a property. We have 104 acres right across the road of Bartlett Farm land that's protected that we purchased in 2004 and then Linda Loring's land out on Eel Point Road we purchased as well. So let's get into it. Sources of nutrient pollution. Being on an island and being on uh, an island that has very sensitive harbors and estuaries but also freshwater resources as well um, leads to a number of problems. But the three main core sources of nutrient pollution which is not just island but uh, nationwide, worldwide is atmospheric deposition. This is one of the number one, this is essentially the number one cause of uh, uh, nitrogen in the waters. Um, and it goes through di from direct rainfall, rainfall just directly hitting the water surface, and then rainfall hitting impervious surfaces, and then going through stormwater systems, and then out into your downwater uh, receptacle. Secondly, septic. Uh, we have parts of our island on sewer, ever expanding, um, but a number of the uh, areas throughout the island are on septic, and they're on either very substandard septic, cesspools and things of that nature, but through upgrading and Title V requirements, when you sell your home, you have to upgrade to Title V, they've been improved. Unfortunately, Title V does nothing to reduce nitrogen into the groundwater. And then finally, fertilizer of what we're talking about here. Um, so you have a number of different areas, agricultural and livestock. We don't necessarily have a lot of livestock, but we do have agriculture. Don't necessarily have a lot of urban runoff, but we do have runoff down in the town um, center. There's about 20 outfalls, stormwater outfalls, that enter our harbor, um, and most of them need upgrading. There's a couple that have been upgraded, Children's Beach and whatnot, but definitely many others. And then one of the most uh, significant sources of pollution here is residential runoff, primarily septic, secondarily fertilizer use. The excess nitrogen and phosphorus ends up into our harbors and estuaries. Um, as a rule of thumb, we're more concerned about phosphorus in freshwater bodies and nitrogen in saltwater bodies. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in a freshwater body, so the more phosphorus 
really stimulates that system and causes it to eutrophify um, and basically essentially creates algae blooms, reduce water quality, um, creates an anoxic events where there's just uh, no oxygen and really causes a lot of uh, upset to the marine organisms that are in there. Nitrogen, same thing, but we're talking about nitrogen. Nitrogen is the limiting nutrient in saltwater bodies. However, additions of nitrogen and phosphorus, whether it's in salt water or it's in fresh water, is still of a concern. Nantucket soils, that's the other thing that really causes a lot of concern and heightened awareness on Nantucket is that our soils are very, very sandy. Um, dominated by uh, sands and fine gravels with low organic matter content. And these soils are um, prone to nutrient leaching and readily infiltrate water. I think all of you know that. Um, you're all familiar with your own gardens and there's a number of landscapers here and um, golf course manager, school, um, super school groundskeepers that you know that these soils need a lot of water. And we're gonna get into irrigation because there's a tricky balance with irrigation and nutrient leaching as well. North side of the island in different areas, there's pockets of clay. That also is a ca cause of concern if it readily leaches right through the sandy soil, hits the pocket of clay, goes right out, <clears throat> which is a, essentially an impermeable barrier, and goes right to the um, down gradient water body, either being a pond or Nantucket Harbor. So why are we concerned? Well, we're concerned for a number of reasons, but in our harbors, obviously we're concerned about eelgrass, and eelgrass being an essential habitat for uh, the uh, scallops. And what we're seeing um, lately is this species of uh, invasive algae called uh, lingbia. And it smothers all of the eelgrass. That's not Nantucket, thank God. But it smothers the eelgrass, reduces habitat, um, reduces light penetration, and essentially destroys uh, the scallops. There's a lot of other issues involved as well, but that's just one of them. So this, up to this point, um, I'm just sort of talking in, in hyperbole, but we actually do have documented increase of nutrients in Nantucket's uh, coastal embayments and freshwater bodies. There's documentation through the town reports, through the Mass Estuaries report, which is a co collaborative between the town and the state um, to determine total maximum daily load numbers of, for nitrogen in our water bodies. We have a set number for Nantucket Harbor, a draft number for Matticut Harbor, and then we're working on one for uh, Hummock Pond, and we actually have a set one for Sacaja Pond as well. Remediation efforts. We've identified the problem. Now we're starting to look at the remediation efforts. We've targeted our septic systems. Um, traditionally, we have Title V. One area that they've been looking at is introducing what's called innovative alternative septic systems, denitrifying systems. They've done tight tanks in limited, limited quantities in Matticut. Um, the state DEP isn't very excited about tight tanks. Um, just because of manual issues. Um, we've expanded sewer in certain areas. We've done some stormwater infrastructure upgrades, such as the st some uh, stuff downtown. And then finally, we're starting to get to fertilizer and build a little momentum on fertilizer. And that, again, is why we're here today. So luckily, 45% of the island, it's probably about 45% with the recent purchase of the Jensen property, is protected um, through various conservation organizations, ours, Nantucket Land Bank, Conservation Foundation, and a few others. This means that without the development scenarios, um, without the land use, without the septic, without the fertilizer, um, you do have a native habitat that, that basically does not leach as many nutrients as um, it would be if it was disturbed with certain land uses. Here's a great slide. This is a slide that I show to a lot of people, not just on, on, on island, but off island as well. <laughs> These are our watershed areas. Everybody familiar with the watershed concept? No. Um, watershed is essentially an area, a delineated and defined area um, that is upgradient of a downwater body. So if you are in Nantucket Harbor watershed, um, if you're, say, in Pocomo, all the land juice that you're doing um, in that area, any sort of um, Fertilizer use, septic, anything that, any pollution, any um, toxic materials could leach into the ground, and your downgradient water body is Nantucket Harbor. There's also a number of fresh water bodies in terms of micro watersheds that could be affected as well, but that's the larger watershed as a whole. Same one for, this is two, made up of two, Matticut, um, Hummock, Maya Comet, 
down gradients also to the ocean as well. So this is a very interesting map because um, it really brings it home a little. I'm out in Tom Nevers and I'm on the cusp of the Tom Nevers Pond uh, water estuary, uh, Tom Nevers Pond watershed area. And so I'm always thinking about what sort of potential land use that I'm doing that could affect the pond. So when you're doing your work either throughout the island or on your own homes, think about what you potentially are doing to the downgraded resource. One thing I don't touch upon that much here, um, primarily because luckily we haven't seen it so much, is nitrogen in our drinking water. Um, there's certain standards of uh, uh, nitrogen uh, parts per million in our drinking water that we can't go above. We are nowhere near it. We have very clean drinking water, um, which is very good. I think it's because primarily the public water supply is very, very deep wells. You do see some private wells in certain areas, um, Madikin, but that's a little bit more because of saltwater intrusion and just the nature of it down there. But down along the coast and down at the receiving um, down gradient, most down gradient areas of these watersheds, you are seeing some higher nitrogen um, levels in these, uh, in, these, in these wells. This is just a little bit of a close up of Nantucket Harbor watershed. Um, that is actually a defined, a legally defined uh, watershed in our regs. This was a tool that they used for some septic upgrades. Um, and one that's important just from where we are today is Hummock Pond watershed. This is Bartlett Farm right here. This is 104 acres. We are right down here, down here. Um, this line could change here and there. Um, it's not a definitive exact science, like if I stand over here, all of a sudden I'm outside of the watershed. If I stand <laughs> over here, I'm in. Um, but definitely some portions of uh, the fields are, and um, John and the rest of the family, they definitely, um, I hope, and just through conversations I have with them, take into consideration their down gradient resource, and that's Hummock Pond. As I said, 45% of the island is protected. This is what you sometimes see, mooring property out there up gradient of head of North Long Pond. What if that turned into that? Uh, which isn't actually that bad. I've seen a lot worse. Um, this is a water sh wetland here with the buffer here. But, and I don't mean to identify anybody, so maybe you live here, but this is uh, abutting the harbor, Nantucket Harbor. And if you saw a 1980 aerial, these wouldn't be here. This is a new house. Some of these are old, old houses along the harbor, but you obviously know about the increase of development on Nantucket. and. With that, you have certain land use. And with that, you have certain fertilizer use that we really need to be, um, uh, pay attention to. Another shot at the Loring property. Gorgeous native um, plant um, ecosystem. Pennsylvania sedge, a little blue stem, bayberry, um, some scrub oak in the background. Well, what if it turns into this? I personally really like this. <laughs> As the head of a of an environmental organization so that advocates for open space protection. It sounds weird, but I do like this. And if you came to my house, you'd see a lot of this. Um, and another interesting point, this is organic, but that doesn't mean anything. We're going to get into that. Um, there really truly is no difference um, when we're talking about nutrient leaching when it comes to organic or synthetic um, ornamental landscapes. So obviously, this compared to this, there's some potential leaching going on. And this, very side, uh, a very cute little side perennial bed with a walking footpath of, um, of lawn. Um, definitely manicured and maintained and perhaps fertilized. Well, actually, definitely is fertilized because I know where this came from. So what have we been doing the past couple years? Um, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the past 10 years, but we're going to skip all the way to 2010. Um, as a result of some issues um, and petitions that came from the community to town meeting and to the Board of Selectmen. Um, the Board of Selectmen created uh, a so-called Article 68. Article 68 was the article that was discussed at a town meeting. And they created a work group to develop a comprehensive plan to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers in our harbors. And that's utilizing the best existing science that's available to us today and develop an implementation plan, budget, and time frame. The committee was made up of nonprofits, department heads, particularly Conservation Commission, landscape professionals, golf course managers, fishermen, concerned citizens, and then my favorite politicians, 
looking around. But we have a TV. This is being recorded, so maybe there'll be a, a few. I'll have some things to say about politicians when it comes to enforcement. Um, a great group of people to, uh, to work with. Um, very inclusive, very comprehensive, a lot of different views going into this. And I think we got to, well, I know we got to an area that was a pretty good consensus, um, at least among the committee and those, and those involved. Recommendations, new Board of Health regulations and a home rule petition, sort of disregard the home rule petition aspect right now. Um, what we really need to know is that the Board of Health regulations um, upon our recommendation were enacted um, January 1st. And these limited the type, quantity, and timing of fertilizer application, and it was island-wide. Remember how I told you about certain watersheds? We were originally thinking about doing it on a watershed basis, but the more we realized about um, the potential effects of not just nitrogen and not just, fo and not just phosphorus, but a combination of the two, that it was best to do it island-wide. Uh, we did a creation of a best management practices manual. Um, well, that was the recommendation, and we actually created that um, through, the, through the committee. Educational initiatives and training for homeowners. One of the things was educational initiatives in terms of our recommendation, and that's what we're doing right now. Um, and that's what the town is beginning to get into. This is a town regulation. This isn't a nonprofit regulation. It's a town regulation, and we're really looking to the town to take a lead role in um, the education and training initiatives. That's the website where the committee recommendations are made. Um, there's also a link to the best management practices document on our website, um, which is in, in all the literature as well. And then you do have a copy of the BMP. Regulations themselves. So let's talk a little bit about the regs, but the meat of this discussion is going to be the best management practices, because they differ a little. Um, in terms of uh, uh, application rates. The core standards are no fertilizer application between October 16th and April 14th. Does anybody, anybody know why, besides the landscapers? Because the plants aren't growing. Plants aren't growing yet. Um, soil temperatures have not reached um, a certain point, and the plants aren't really utilizing any of the nutrients. Um, there's a high potential if you do not go in this window. Uh, fertilize in this window that there might be some leaching. That's just for the set of a regulation we needed to pick a time so we understand that it might be a very warm, warm spring and that if somebody is potentially fertilizing on April 10th and it's very, very warm and the plants are obviously growing, that might not be that much of a problem, but you do need to have some sort of time frame to go by. No phosphorus unless a soil test indicates a deficiency. This is in the regs. You cannot apply phosphorus with certain ex uh, uh, exemptions, such as phosphorus that's in compost. You cannot apply phosphorus unless a soil test indicates a deficiency. So that's very important. We'll get that into that a little bit in the best management practices. Uh, no more than a total of three pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year. This is a fairly standard recommendation, but not utilized as much as we would like to see. And then here's some of the meat. And again, this is for just the regs. There is a different threshold in the best management practices because we feel that if somebody's going to follow the best management practices, there's a whole bunch of information in there that provides a bit of a buffer to go a little higher in your application rate for quick release nitrogen. No more than 0.25 pounds of quick release uh, nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per application, and no more than 0.5 pounds per total. In the BMP, it's 0.5 quick release and one pound per total. And then what's very important, which is somewhat in the regs, but not necessarily, it's more so in the BMP, is inspect and monitor. monitor. And we're going to get into the inspect and monitor concept and the spoon feeding concept and just the pay attention concept a little bit later. Standards for commercial applicators. This is in the regs that were enacted. All commercial applicators must receive a license from the Board of Health and follow the best management practices manual. In absence of a licensing program, they must still follow the best management practices manual. And so every f landscaper that is out there right now, sort of, um, or anybody, has to be following the BMP and the guidelines. We understand 
being the nonprofit and being part of the committee, and then I guess I could say the Royal Re, the town as well, speaking for them, understand that this is an initial year and somewhat of a bridge year between people not necessarily knowing, homeowners and landscapers not necessarily knowing the requirements and being fully aware of the requirements. So I think if somebody is out there using a plant tone product with phosphorus in it or any other type of product, they're not gonna come down hard on them. Um, but they should at least pay attention to what's going on, I guess you could say. Enforcement, what we're hoping for is an enforcement program next year. We're hoping for a licensing program to begin in the fall and winter, which will be a co I, I'm hoping a coalition licensing program that has buy-in from all the landscapers so that they're almost not necessarily designing the course and the test, but they are playing a very large part of it. Um, and then there's enforcement provision. Enforcement, um, in another talk I had, I had three question marks after the enforcement because enforcement is gonna be the most difficult thing to do with this. Um, I am not going to know, the town um, natural resources department is not gonna know what somebody is doing off of Pulpus Road. Um, and so education is going to be the most important thing. There are gonna be times where it's fairly obvious, not that you're going down somebody's, uh, going somebody's, down somebody's driveway and you see a bright, bright green lawn, because that bright green lawn might be adhering to the best manager practices. It's if you see somebody applying a product that is clearly not in conformance with the best management practices. So there is a non-criminal disposition and it's $300 per day for each day of violation. That's directly in the regs. So let's get into the heart of it. Um, best management practices manual. This is what came out of the group. And I must say that I was um, mostly just a facilitator in this. Um, the people that really played the most were the landscapers, um, the golf course managers, and some other individuals. So their work really um, showed through in, in this document. The objectives of the BMP, this is somewhat, um, I've already sort of laid the basis for this. It's to provide the landscapers and the professionals, uh, landscape professionals and homeowners with the knowledge, basically to apply fertilizer in what we feel is an appropriate way, um, promote the water resources while also maintaining he healthy and vibrant ornamental landscapes. So we're trying to get two objectives into one. Uh, reducing the amount of fertilizer used by promoting certain cultural practices, and then offer uh, site planning guidelines and suggestions for ecological restoration. Um, finally, provide science-based guidance, and that's one of the key things, science-based guidance for nutrient management of lawns. So let's go into the BMP sections just a little bit. Um, and if you guys have any questions, this is a small enough group that I think we can just do questions, and there's a lot of knowledgeable people in this group. So if you have any questions, please throw them out there. Site assessment, that's the first thing, is site assessment. You have to identify your site conditions. When you go out, where's south face facing? That's one of the most obvious things in terms of determining south facing. What's sunny, what's shade? Um, where are the wet sites? If there's maybe pockets of clay, where are some other um, geographical interests in, in that site? Again, site planning for new construction, somewhat similar to identifying the site um, conditions. But one thing that we see throughout the island, um, or at least I saw it a lot more from about 2000, 2007 during the boom, was people would strip the entire lot. And we're talking about sometimes two, three acres of just stripping, and they only want to have 4,000 square feet of homes and 6,000 square feet of ornamental landscapes. And like heavily ornamental landscapes, but then they realize that they have all this other stripped land that they have to deal with, so they don't necessarily let it all regrow into natives. They say, oh, what the hell, we'll just make it all an ornamental landscape, and all of a sudden you have a large, large amount of ornamental landscape, which is not necessarily just a problem for nutrient leaching, but we're talking about wildlife habitat, um, uh, other issues such as that. So incorporate as much native understood habitat as possible, like I said. Site planning for existing landscapes, similar just to the identifying site conditions, then choosing a management plan. This is what um, we identified in the BMP in terms of creating a dialogue with your landscaper. Um, many of you are either landscapers or maintain your own um, properties, but if you don't, 
choosing a management plan with your landscaper. One thing that we're trying to do is reach out not just to the landscapers but to the homeowners so that the homeowners will go to their landscapers and say, have you read this? No, you haven't? Okay, well, if I want to retain your services, uh, if you want me to retain your services, I want you to come up with a management plan that adheres to this. And that creates a business another business opportunity for the landscaper, but it also creates a clear communication and management plan between the landscaper and the homeowner. Uh, soil no nutrients and soil test. So this is the second or third section of the BMP that just talks about soil, um, which is one of the biggest um, uh, functions of uh, nutrient capacity and, and nutrient leaching. Um, I wish I took more soils in, in college. Yeah. Where can we get a soil test? Where can you get a soil test? You can do soil tests yourself, um, you, and you can send them to UMass Extension. What's the best place that they should? Yeah, UMass. You can go online to there. Yeah, go on to online to UMass UMass Extension and Soil Science, and then they'll tell you the process of doing it. Um, uh, I'll get into the why test, but tips for retaining, they'll give you some tips for retaining a good sample. Um, and that's the best place to do it from a local point of view. Other landscapers use some different places that they have a good relationship with. But from a homeowner's point of view, I would say um, UMass Extension is the best place to do it. Why would you test it? Well, I think everybody knows what the soil consists of. Um, it's essentially sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter that's derived from plant and animal matter. Um, I was going to say that I, I wish I took this soil science class in college and because um, it's just, I, I'm somewhat amazed and fascinated by soil. And we started doing a little bit of work about soil in the BMP and then we realized we could have written a 300 page document about soil. So we <laughs> condensed it quite some, some amount. Why would you test your soil? The analogy I like to use, particularly um, I'm a dog owner and if I go to the vet and I have a problem with my dog or even myself if I go to the doctor and I have a problem um, that the doctor cannot ident essentially identify they do a blood test that's one of the first things that they do is they do a blood test and they come back and look at look at the particulars of your of your blood well if we see that there's a problem or not even a problem but we want to know the health of our soil the health of our plants that are living in our soil we do a soil test it gives you all the nutrients macro and micro and then it gives you some other identifying things about your soil. Again, the websites that are out there, tips for obtaining a good soil, give you some information. The BMP gives you information on tips for obtaining a good, good soil sample. This is um, what comes back. Um, do you know where this is from, Mark? Yeah, a and Laboratory. And so this is a private lab laboratory that does soil testing, and this was one of um, a local landscaper that sent this out there. It gives you your soil pH, which is um, a determination on how acidic or non-acidic your soil is. Um, the ranges that we like to see um, is about six to seven for turf. Um, and I think the landscapers have a much better idea in terms of the particulars on that. It gives you phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, um, some of the other micronutrients um, as well, and metals. Um, and then also down here, it gives you organic matter content, 6.9%. For a Nantucket soil, that's very, very high. That's probably a manicured, um, very amended soil. And if I think I remember right, that was amended with compost two times, and then he got a 6.9%. The recommendation in the BMP is a threshold of 4% organic matter, because the more organic matter that we have in our soils, the more potential for leaching of nutrients in our soils. There's a lot more information on that in the BMP. Again, what I, I didn't necessarily mention this in the beginning um, is that this is merely just a touch, a background of the BMP. The meat is in the BMP and if you can leave with something today, you'll leave with an outline of the BMP and then open up the BMP, look at it, read it, dissect it, um, apply it to your own existing management plan if you do it yourself or apply it to your own with your with your landscaper. This is a recommendation down here. Pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year. They say 3.5 and then four pounds of potash as well. Um, I'm sorry, uh, potassium. So fertilizer types and um, sources. Uh, on a bag we have 
the MPK ratio. It's fairly simple. Um, this is froze from downstairs. It's an organic lawn food. And your MPK ratio, I forgot to put up the, the label up on here, is the ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the bag, essentially the percentage of each in the bag. This is 900, 9% nitrogen here, zero phosphorus, zero potassium. Under the nitrogen, it gives you the percentage of soil release, which can either be water, which is essentially water insoluble, um, uh, which you see a lot of organic products made of, or coated slow release, which is some of the synthetic products. Water insoluble products, they need to basically be broken down by microorganisms for the nitrogen to be made available. The coated slow release, there's a coated polymer uh, on some of the synthetic fertilizers that breaks down over a slower period of time, essentially a slow release product. Then you have your water soluble, which is directly released into the environment when it hits water. Uh, phosphorus can become mobile in the soil. I sort of skipped around a little here, sorry, but let me just go through nitrogen and phosphorus real quick. Some of the past information, um, science that was done up to about 2002, 2005, 2007, um, looked at phosphorus as being somewhat immobile in the soil, that you could apply a lot of phosphorus and not necessarily be concerned with its mobilization. Well, they've done a lot of um, research, um, particularly one example is a plume on Cape Cod um, that has a lot of phosphorus in it, that it's, they've identified the upgrade in um, source, and then it's moving, moving, moving very slowly, but albeit it is moving. And sufficient phosphorus can dissolve in runoff water and leachate to cause pollution of water bodies if the soft soil test phosphorus is increased too much. So that's the important point, what we're trying to stress with the soil test, that if your soil test says that there is sufficient phosphorus, Very high, his phosphorus. No need to add phosphorus whatsoever. Um, he has all has very high calcium. I leave that up to the landscapers and the other knowledgeable people to determine what that actually means in terms of what they want to grow. But um, the phosphorus, very clearly, as it relates to the BMP, the regs, and the science that's out there, that if your soil test says you don't need phosphorus, you should not be applying phosphorus. Sorry, where does nitrogen go? The soil test does not show nitrogen. It does not show nitrogen. Thus, you can apply nitrogen on the rates that we're talking about. But that's also based upon your own individual observances of the property that you're using as well. If you see your, we're going to get into the application rates, but if you see that your plants are performing fairly well, under a certain standard of application, it might not be necessary to apply more. Okay, another key point which I mentioned a little bit, over application of either organic or synthetic fertilizer will lead to nutrient leaching and runoff. Whether it's organic or synthetic, there is no, necessarily no separation. Some of the organic, most of the organic products and the bulk of the majority in, within the organic products are slow release. Slow release is a a lot easier to manage in terms of leaching, but over application of, of slow release products year after year after year, both nitrogen and phosphorus have the potential to be leached out. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about compost. Um, and it's just very interesting, this whole process, because it was a learning process for me. Um, I went into this process with a background in organic agriculture. I've worked in Vermont, Oregon, um, Hawaii, uh, a couple other places with a background of if it's organic, it's fine. But again, I was more on a pesticide angle um, than uh, nutrient leaching um, because some of the places w that I was working in, nutrient leaching wasn't as, because of the particular types of soil, wasn't that much of a concern. Um, but getting to Nantucket with our soils, um, I've really learned a lot about organics. Now, the role of compost. Compost is an amazing material, as we all know. It provides organic matter. It's a food for source for beneficial bacteria and fungi. Um, it improves so moist so soil moisture retention, and then uh, it improves nutrient retention as well, which is fairly important. 
However, it's considered a fertilizer under the BMP, which not a lot of people have been thinking about. It's always been considered as a soil amendment, to amend the soil to improve these, but not necessarily a fertilizer. Well, de determining on what your compost is made of is really going to determine um, whether or not it should be treated as a fertilizer. It's going to be treated as a fertilizer, but a compost with leaf litter, 0.1% nitrogen, 0.05 to 0.2, that's very low. That's very, very low. But as you go up into the manure-based compost, you have a poultry manure, that's 1.5% to 2, 1.5 to 2.5 for phosphorus. So you write there now, this is very high in animal. Very high, yes. Yep. And the room was full. Many people on this island was outbreak. Yep. The rural farm. Yep. And nobody is uh, seem to be concerned about it. It's very high. I, I was raised with chicken around. My mother always talked about that. And uh, nobody is talking about it. There's not a group now really being taking place like you do for, uh, I mean, we've been following you for years. Yeah. 20 years yep. ago. Yep. Never was before. You're seeing a lot more backyard chicken um, coops yeah. um, everywhere. I mean, I have three around me. I might get a couple of chickens myself. They just have to incorporate if they if they put their if they put their chicken manure into their compost or they use it as a slow release product at some point. If they use that, they, they it's got to be incorporated into their total pounds um, yeah, of nitrogen per year. It's got to be it's got to be education because nobody's going to be controlling that. One thing that has happened, luckily, we have a permitting process for development within wetlands or within 100 feet of wetland. There was a proposal to do chicken and sheep, uh, chicken and sheep all along Pulpus Harbor, and they eliminated the chicken because they had to do outside food being brought in. Um, which would have essentially created a, a nitrogen excess load and a phosphorus excess load because you're bringing it in. But the sheep were all right because the sheep were eating the grass that was going to be decomposed anyways, and then they're transforming it through their guts and then out through, the through water their. water pollution, you do know, animal farming is the highest pollution of our water system. Yes. In our world. Yes, it's just, it's just very important to make sure that you're monitoring what goes in but and what comes out. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I think, I think that's, that's an issue that we can bring up to the town to, to see. Yeah. But I should not do that. I mean, somebody in the uh, higher rank, like you do, should really. Aren't people becoming uh, involved in that, being concerned about it? I think so. I think the Board of Health is definitely being concerned about it. And but they allowed it? Well, I'm sorry, what? Did they give the permission to raise the animals? Yeah, you're allowed to raise the animals. It's just they're going to have to pay a little bit more attention in terms of the animals' effect on water quality. When and we can, we'll, we can save that for a little, a little bit later. Okay, so compost application table. And this is as it relates to phosphorus. I had another one for nitrogen, um, but this I borrowed off of um, uh, Dr. Tom Morris, which I didn't mention. The BMP was also um, designed and reviewed, more so reviewed and edited, by uh, scientists from UMass and UMass Extension, UConn, and Cornell. So it was peer-reviewed. Peer that was a very important point that we wanted to, to do so that it wasn't just um, a local effort, albeit a, an environmental organization, environmentalists, advocates, um, permitting agencies, and the industry making it, but it's very good to have the outside peer review as well. So this is your depth of inch per compost. Things that we're seeing now, um, not just in perennial bed applications of compost, but you are here and there. It's slowed down a little, I think. Uh, have you guys seen it slow down, the compost applications on lawns, or is yeah, it still? Yeah. It slowed down. It, it went, it, it got, it caught on in about 2010, 2011, but I'm starting to see it slow down a little. Um, maybe not so much for this, more so for logistical reasons in terms of spreaders and applications and ability to spread. But this is very important. You put a um, two-inch depth of, um, of compost um, 
per yard, uh, yard per acre, and tons per acre. If you do it of leaf, it's 2.5%. If you do it of poultry manure at two inches, 124. It's gigantic, gigantic. So that is very, very concerning. Um, in the red, this, uh, this isn't in the BMP. Um, we have, or maybe we have a phosphorus one. I think, no, this is. We have a phosphorus and a nitrogen chart um, in terms of compost applications. And again, there is an exemption for phosphorus application in terms of it being in compost because we knew there were so many beneficial things about compost that just to eliminate compost would have been um, a little over, overboard. Okay, BMP, this is the core of it, the fertilizer application. It is chapter, let's see where it is, because this is, I, when you go home, this is what you should be reading. Section six, guidelines for timing and rates for application of turf grass fertilizer. Similar to what the regulations say, this is a little bit more lenient, but it's based upon the BMP. And this is interesting, based upon discussions with some of the landscapers. This is a business model change in terms of um, how many pounds per 1,000 square feet um, with a 0.5 total per application preferred, um, and then um, the amount of uh, quick release fertilizer as well. Business model change. Um, the landscapers can tell you a little bit more about it in terms of how it's a business model, but there has to be some clear communication with the landowner and the landscapers that aren't willing to do the business model change to um, do more frequent application of smaller amounts of fertilizer. Yeah. Um, now that you say that, is the town doing anything to regulate the people that are selling the uh, fertilizer? I mean, we don't you think that would be a, a key thing to eliminate that right from the market? There is a state, when we did this whole process, there's a state commerce law that does not let municipalities interfere with the sale of fertilizers. Well, and no, or. Yep, we've already started the town resource, natural resource coordinator who's charged with basically doing all the education and oversight of the regulation. He's already, already reached out to Valero's um, Marine Home and um, Island Lumber, which has that new spot. Marine Home said that they're going to be doing their ordering in the fall and that they'll switch to all available products that are available to do this. Um, I'm sure Liz, Liz is, gonna, is ha happy to, to switch over as well for Bartlett Farm. There is a bit of a difficulty in terms of finding the right product if you want to promote organics, because most organics have phosphorus in it, but there are products that are out there. Um, there's also a difficult, diff difficulty in getting the right product that's synthetic as well on island, but I think the products are out there, and Ben and Mark, they're already looking at those and trying to get the vendors to start doing that. So that's something that has to start working on now. It's a great point and it's something that we, like me from my position, have to remember because if the vendors are already gonna do their ordering, then we're sort of missed a, another whole year for the homeowner. You guys mostly buy your stuff in bulk off island. For the schools, do you? Yeah, so when these guys do their ordering, they're gonna have to do that as well if they want to adhere to it. Uh, spoon feeding concept, this is a, some, some this again is a business model change where you have more frequent applications at lower amounts. And the individuals that can um, adjust their maintenance regime are going to be able to do this. The individuals that can't, in terms of um, this is how we've always been doing it, are not going to be doing that, are not going to be able to adjust. Um, it's going to be difficult and I think it's going to require a lot of communication with the landscapers who are not vested or interested and the, um, and the homeowners who are not vested or interested. The golf courses and somewhat the schools when the kids aren't playing on it in the, in the summertime, although do you guys do the fields as well or the park and rec fields or is it just the schools? Just the schools. Just the schools. They can probably do this small application um, angle because it's almost an, an estate owner, uh, an estate gardener, where they're out there every day. They can monitor between the applications. They can skip an application if they think it's necessary because they know they're going to be out there the next day and the day and the day. And if they say, oh, I shouldn't have skipped, they can reapply within the guidelines. Um, for the landscaper, I think it's a little bit more difficult because they have a number of clients. They have their regime for certain clients. 
and they're going to have to readjust everything. Um, you guys know a lot more about it than I do in terms of how they're going to adjust. Some of them are definitely on board in terms of readjusting. I think it's going to be difficult to get the other guys on board, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, in the BMP, when I was talking about er applications and um, intervals uh, and frequencies, here's your frequencies for a two, three, and four week um, uh, intervals if you're applying at a certain rate. And then also issues to consider. Um, if you do recycle your glass clippings over a year, I think what the standard is, that's one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. So if you're recycling your glass clippings, if you're leaving them on, you have to incorporate that one pound of nitrogen into your maintenance regime. Continued compost applications, as I said, if you compost or rehabilitate a lawn or garden once with compost, it's probably OK. But if, this, if you continually doing your standard, like a lot of the gardeners, the perennial bed gardeners out there, they compost every year, you're going to have a buildup of organic matter. You're going to have a buildup of nitrogen that's not being used, a buildup of phosphorus that's not being used, and it will leach out. Foliar feeding, we're starting to see a lot more foliar feeding on homeowner's properties. Landscapers are starting to utilize foliar feeding. I don't know what that word is. Foliar feeding is essentially liquid fertilizer. It's a, a, a fertilizer product that's up, uh, mixed with water and then applied with a hose spray or even a larger industrial unit. Um, it's perhaps one of the most efficient ways to feed when you have a very healthy turf ecosystem because you have a lot of uh, vegeta vegetative uh, leaf uh, surface mass that the fertilizer can hit, and none of it's hit hitting the ground. So if, if you have a granular product, it's got to go through the ground, soil, um, infiltrate through the roots. Foliar product, it hits most of it, large percentage of it hits essentially the, the vegetative surface. Spreader calibration, this is something that's very important. It's talked about a little bit in the BMP in terms of getting your spreaders um, calibrated correctly and then applying correct amounts with the spreader. And then one thing, homeowners as well, record keeping. Know what, know what you've applied in the past year um, and come up with a maintenance plan, uh, application rate plan in the, uh, in the fall of the previous year because you're going to be applying fertilizer potentially in the fall in support of what you're going to see in the spring. Uh, in the BMP, there's a number of sample management plans, organic, synthetic, and a combination of two. Um, uh, it's a great guideline, but again, each property is going to be different in terms of a management plan, but it's a good guideline. What we've been talking a lot of is, is about turf in this, and um, I know that different people have different areas of interest, but turf um, is a huge component of the BMP because it, it was it is essentially one of the largest um, opportunities for nutrient leaching. We have a number of turf care cultural practices that we discuss in the, um, in the BMP, such as mowing frequency and height, and height allow your um, grass to grow a little longer, is very important, recycle the clippings, core aeration, this is something that a homeowner can do as well, um, I've done it, you just rent, a, rent the aerator from um, Island supply, and um, it takes the cores, certain cores. How would you guys describe it? <laughs> it's just it's a machine that um, takes core, little small divots, little cores um, out of the uh, out of the soil. Basically, helps out helps with compacted soil. Introduces oxygen into it. Introduces some aeration, and then dethatching is another compo um, uh, thought in terms of removing this thatch layer that builds up. Um, which is somewhat detrimental to lawns and gardens, uh, not gardens, lawns. The BMP is a fluid document and is going to be needed, is going to need revision from time to time. Like I said, we focused a lot on turf and I think the BMP could use, um, it's good right now, but it could probably use some improvement in terms of management of garden trees and shrubs. We're probably going to um, incorporate some knowledge from the Bartlett folks. The Bartlett folks are actually um, not Bartlett Farm, but Bartlett Tree Experts. They're doing a lot of good work in terms of their management of uh, nutrients, uh, fertilizer applications for their trees. Pesticide applications, that's a different story. We're not really involved in that. Um, we're just talking about fertilizers. So we're going to utilize some of their knowledge and their expertise in, to, in terms of revision. We also need to do a little bit more work in terms of the shrubs. 
But the garden application, the same standards, got to do a soil test. Um, the recommendation is, I think we said once every two to three years to do a soil test for both turf and both your gardens. Um, this is limited. It's not three pounds, it's two pounds of nitrogen per year. One of the reasons why is there's a bit of a um, uh, application of a cautionary factor in here. You don't have a root mass in a perennial garden like you do in a turf um, ecosystem, where the turf ecosystem has a very dense, if it's healthy, a very dense root mass that can uptake the fertilizer on a regular basis if it's being applied appropriately. With some of these others, there's a lot of spaces, a lot of in-between areas, in-between the root masses, that if it's not being applied right, or even if it is being applied right, there's some areas for leaching uh, possibility. Again, being careful with the compost applications, as I said before, in terms of um, the amount that you're spreading. Um, they have to be, the uh, gardeners out there have to be very concerned about that. And then uh, recommendation for foliar applications. Um, as well is, um, is a good thing. Now, personally, um, and again, the BMP is based upon science, but it's also based upon industry practices and knowledge from the industry. But finally, it's also based upon personal observation. And for me, this is just for me, um, my perennial gardens do very well without fertilizer application per year. Um, I, if I do do anything, I make my own compost. Um, with all the yard waste that is accumulated through the year, and then I put it back in and recycle it, and it does fine. Um, I'm pleased with the, the presentation of my perennial gardens without fertilizer applications. I'm not gonna say that's a standard because mine works. We do have a standard in the BMP. It's just throughout the BMP, not just with the perennial, but with turf, apply a little and see what happens. And then if it needs a little bit more, apply a little bit more. Finally, let's go, we're sort of going over time here, but native plants, we all know native plants should be incorporated into the perennial garden ecosystem, um, ornamental ecosystem, because they really do not require any fertilizers, they're drought tolerant, they've evolved to this type of, um, these type of conditions, so they're very adaptable to being planted. Beach plum, um, Hudsonia, Tomatosa, Heather, and then uh, gorgeous butterfly weed, which is a food source for our monarch populations. Role of irrigation, we've touched on this a little, but it's, it's a whole chapter and section on in the, in the BMP. As I said, um, with the water-soluble nitrogen, that nitrogen is activated in the presence of water. Um, and too much water results in potential nitrogen leaching. So um, the BMP goes into designing irrigation systems for specific plantings, whether it's your perennial garden, your turf garden, your trees, your shrubs. Um, installing sensors is a very important thing. Um, I don't know how many of you actually have automated irrigation systems. The landscapers that are out there, you obviously manage them and utilize them. Um, Calibrating sprinklers is very important. And then again, modifying and adjusting throughout the season. Not just paying attention to the irrigation, but paying attention to everything. This isn't rocket science, but it is a science. It's a science and people need to pay attention to the results, the effects of their irrigation, their fertilizer use, their cultural practices, everything that's going on. Um, yes, there is a list at the office. It's gigantic, but yeah, for all of them. There's a... Yeah. Um, it's a very big list that Dunwoody, Sorry and Dunwoody did a while ago. That's an idea that, that maybe we can do with Liz in terms of coming up with a, pla a, a, a pamphlet at some point in the future where we just basically come up with natives that are nice to be utilized in the ornamental yeah, landscape. A lot of with that yeah. And I know that Liz and a couple of the other people at the nurseries at Surfing Hydrangea, they point people in that direction from time to time, right? Yeah, we carry yeah. an American Beauties line down below. It's actually a pop with American Beauties on it and that is those are natives. Yeah. Yep. Okay, implementation, um, education and outreach. 
We have a core group of landscape professionals that are working with the town and with um, the nonprofits, land council, that are interested in promoting this further. Um, I sympathize with these people because um, it's very difficult, uh, one, to be a landscaper on the island, but with the amount of competition that is on the island. And if you have other individuals that are not adhering to the BMP um, and are cutting corners and skipping steps, um, that potentially gives them a competitive advantage. I'd hate to say it, but it does um, give them a competitive advantage. And we need to get all the other landscapers on board. We have some other ideas going forward. And this is in terms of education and outreach. This isn't enforcement. This is education and outreach with all the landscapers that are out there. It's a two-pronged approach. The landscapers have to be aware and talk to the homeowners and say, I have to do this. This is a regulation now. It's not just an advisory thing. It's not just a guideline. This is a regulation. And then the homeowners have to go to their landscapers and say, I want this done. So it's a back and forth relationship. Um, and then again, retail is um, a very important issue in terms of getting the right um, product on island. And the educational information at the vendor as well. If you have somebody that just shows up for the summer and not wants to do their four-step program, and they walk into Marine Homes, they give me my four-step product, they're not, if, if there's no educational information there, if the, if the vendor isn't very informed about what's going on and has the ability to tell them that, here, here's your alternative, this is what's required, if they just say, no, we don't sell that anymore, here, use this, that's a little different. They need some educational um, information as well. Licensing, as I said, there has to be, there, in, the, in the regulations, there's going to be a licensing requirement. How this is going to formulate, we're not sure. We're hoping it's going to happen in the fall and the winter time. Um, hopefully be industry-led in terms of the licensing with the official license being given um, by the town. And the license, I think, an approval of the license would be probably a test, some sort of um, a workshop indication that they have a clear knowledge of the best management practices. Government follow through to all the politicians that are out there. Um, I make this point um, in support of the government, but also as a nonprofit that's not working for the government. These BMPs. I'm sorry, the regulations were adopted by the Board of Health in July, August of last year. They went into effect in January of this, this year. The town has never done any single educational initiative in terms of speaking with a group of people like this yet. So I say that in support of the government. We want to, I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we want to continue to work with the departments um, and um, we got the school's uh, groundskeeper here right now. He's been on board with a lot of the stuff we've done in the past. That's great. Jimmy Manchester is fairly on board with some of the park and recreation stuff. But we need the government's support to work with the community, to work with the homeowners and the landscapers to tell them about these regulations. It's very difficult for a nonprofit to tell people about regulations and what they have to do if the government isn't doing anything to either enforce or educate the community about them. That's my little spiel about that. Any questions? Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, have you been through the Civic League to try to get information um, out there? Yes. Um, we um, have spoken with Mary um, and uh, Alan and Sarah at the Civic League, and we have written invitations to each homeowner association member organizations to say that myself and Jeff Carlson at the town are available to do workshops like this to the groups. If you can spread the word even more, we've had response from Brant Point, Pocomo, or maybe not Pocomo, but um, Pulpis and a couple others, but I really would like to hit everybody as possible. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, we have copies of the BMP available in Spanish. Um, if anybody needs it, um, because obviously there's a, a very large Spanish-speaking contingency. You need to plain Spanish. And in English as well. <laughs> we have a condensed version of the regulations in a very simple pamphlet form, um, which you can use as well.
can become licensed. Yes. If they, um, obviously, whatever test there is, show proficiency in the DMT, um, which there seems to be some very educated people in here. So I think um, that's definitely a good possibility for some people. And also the compost question that you had earlier, Ann, um, that was eye-opening to all of us on the committee. Um, and we learned a lot through that whole process. But even like poultry manure, it's there. A lot of people have chickens, like you said. Um, even going down to Home Game Partners and grabbing sand to dilute it, it's, you know, that's a possibility. Yeah. So, and because you just, just can't get rid of it. We've got the maze of technology on, they don't do it. My mother was significantly doing that. Right. And it's a myth. Any other questions? Uh, fully, you mentioned foliar fertilizer. Yeah. Is, is there a way of hooking that up to your irrigation system? Um, so it just sucks it up, up and blows it out? Mark, do you, he, yeah, Mark's. It is actually, but um, for homeowners, I don't think it's that uh, efficient or safe. Yes. Yeah. Someday it would, I think it will be, but it's, I don't think it's there quite yet. There's products that are out there that you can a, a, attach a mix to your hose. Right. Either a miracle Grow product, or you can even do this, as long as you have the right filters to fil filter that stuff out and it doesn't get the, the unit all messed up. So there's ways to do that where you're just spraying it like this. Yeah. And, oh, I have a question just to do with pollution. Yep. What about uh, the ponds with the number of ducks that are in the ponds? And then on the, on the south head of uh, Hummer, in the summer, you see kids, people swimming in the pond. Yep. And it's fresh water. Okay? Yep. And if it's salt water, it, you know, it makes a difference. Yep. Um, the ponds have definitely, um, the, the presence of birds with our changing uh, climate patterns have definitely caused more of a concern. The Canadian geese are not leaving the island anymore. They're wintering, overwintering. Um, and we are seeing their presence much, much more in the freshwater ponds. If you go down to Kansu Springs, Kansu Pond there, where they're doing a lot of Phragmites work, that's one of the most disgusting, degraded water bodies that's out there. And a lot of it is because of the, the nature of the system, it's a sink. There's not a lot of infiltration from the ocean water. It's just essentially a sink from storm water and other stuff. But the mallard ducks that stay there, the nitrogen and bacteria that's coming out of them is gigantic. So you're talking about what do we do about the ducks? Well. You could do deterrence if you could on a small scale project like Kansu, but to deter ducks on somewhere large scale like Hummock Pond would be next to impossible. So you're essentially talking about removing and killing ducks. So that comes with a whole nother angle in terms of convincing the community. And we did talk about it a little bit on our, on not necessarily as it related to fertilizer, but as a pollution source as a whole. And we continue to talk about it with our health department. It's just, uh, They've run into obstacles when they start thinking about culling uh, avian fauna. The other thing years ago, you took the map to the United States, you got three flyways. You got the west, the center, and the east. Yep. And as kids growing up, to hunt ducks, that wasn't. The only way we got the ducks was when, they, when the wind blew a certain way and blew them into the ponds. Yep. Otherwise, there wasn't that many ducks yeah. in the pond. Yeah. And I think you're going to start. I think you're going to start seeing seeing um, culling programs here and there, if we get the septic problem under control, the fertilizer problem under control, under control, and we still are having um, hot pockets of nutrient overloading, or which is even more concerned to human health, bacterial contamination, fecal coliform, enterococci concentrations. Then you're going to see probably more culling of avian fauna. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know Richard. Richard tests my comet for fecal coliforms, my comet pond. So that's tested and closed on a. Re I don't know if it's closed on a regular basis, but it's tested on a regular basis. It's it's closed. It's closed a few times, and then um, Hummock Pond. I don't think that's tested. The south of Hummock Pond. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, on the other side through Barrett, uh, Barrett Farm Road. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Children yeah. So that's probably one they should be testing. Yeah. Any other questions? You mentioned that Title V doesn't take care of uh, nitrogen. Not at all. How would you, it's a little bit off topic, but how, how would you get a septic system to take care of that? Um, I mentioned that there's um, what's called alternative innovative septic systems, which have a denitrifying component in the septic system. It's an additional cost, which is fairly large. There's no regulation on hand right now to enforce people to do IAs unless they have certain conditions that they can't meet um, on their property themselves in terms of um, um, area size, waivers, things of that nature, then they force them to do an IA system. Um, you're seeing a lot of IA systems out in Madikit right now. IAs. Innovative alternative. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, what I didn't talk about in the pro and that's a great question in the in the program today is the algae concentrations. I mentioned a little bit in terms of how that's a um, uh, comes out of eutrophication of certain water bodies. But Hummock Pond has a gigantic algae mat that grows in there, and a lot of it is based upon the nutrient concentrations in there. And algae mats are very difficult to control once it's in there because you have an internal nutrient loading. You, if to, as it grows and grows through the years, it's being fed by the source of nutrients coming into the pond. And all of a sudden it gets to a certain mass and quantity where when it breaks down through the summer, there's already enough nitrogen and phosphorus after it's, it's broken down and the next year it feeds on that nitrogen and phosphorus and just internally goes and there's a nutrient load. In terms of how we address it, we do address it through um, the nutrient inputs. We do still have to uh, address nutrient inputs, but we've had a couple of ideas that we've explored with the town where we do a harvester, and I've spoken with Bob Williams from Hummock Pond Association on purchasing and or leasing a harvester, which would take the material from the pond, um, get it down to a point where we could actually um, get a handle on it, and then if you reduce the nutrient inputs, maybe long term, it's going to go back to um, a, a, a better spot. So draining it helps? It drain it helps. That's a conversation we can have at another time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got to wrap up, but one more question. Uh, on testing, is there a plan on testing? I see truckloads of compost and leaving the landfill. Yes. Is that tested prior to them dumping? That's a, great, that's a great question. Is his, um, his question was on compost, and is it tested before it leaves the dump? Compost is tested in terms of a beneficial reuse um, requirement by DEP for, tox for toxins, for heavy metals and other toxins. It's not tested per se for nitrogen and or phosphorus. So I think we need to, we being a land council, need to work with the Board of Selectmen to get that compost tested because it's great. If it's really high in nitrogen and phosphorus and it's being used inappropriately and in inappropriate applications, it's definitely a pollution source. They used to, I have yeah. the last one that the, the testing that was about three, four years ago. Yeah. I don't think they do now. Yeah, I don't know. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>